The following is a reading from a book called The Redeemer's Tears Over Lost Souls by the Puritan John Howe. It was originally published in 1686. This counsel has to do with people who fear they've committed the unpardonable sin and their day of grace is past. Howe says, Therefore no man can certainly know or ought to conclude concerning himself or others as long as they live, that the season of grace is quite over with them. As we can conceive no rule God has set to himself to proceed by in ordinary cases of this nature, so neither is there any he has set us to judge by in this case. It were to no purpose, and could be of no use to men to know so much. Therefore it were unreasonable to expect God should have settled and declared any rule by which they might come by the knowledge of it. As the case is then, namely, there being no such rule, no such thing can be concluded. For who can tell what an arbitrary sovereign free agent will do if he declare not his own purpose himself? How should it be known when the Spirit of God has been often working upon the soul of a man, that this or that shall be the last act, and that he will never put forth another? And why should God make it known? To the person himself whose case it is, it is manifest it could be of no benefit. Nor is it to be thought the Holy God will ever so alter the course of his own proceedings, but that it shall finally be seen to all the world that every man's destruction was entirely into the last of himself. If God had made it evident to a man that he were finally rejected, he were obliged to believe it. But shall it ever be said God has made anything a man's duty which were inconsistent with his felicity? that having sinned himself into such a condition in which he is forsaken of God, is indeed inconsistent with it. And so the case is to stand, i.e., that his perdition be in immediate connection with his sin, not with his duty, as it would be in immediate necessary connection with his duty. If he were bound to believe himself finally forsaken, in a lost creature, for that belief makes him hopeless, and a very devil justifies his unbelief of the gospel towards himself by removing and shutting up towards him the object of such a faith, and consequently brings him at her to this state, that he perishes, not because he does not believe God reconcilable to man, but because, with particular application to himself, he ought not so to believe it. And it were most unfit, and of a very pernicious consequence that such a thing should be generally known concerning others. It were to anticipate the final judgment, to create a hell upon earth, to tempt them whose doom were already known, to do all the mischief in the world, which malice and despair can suggest and prompt them to it. It were to mingle devils with men and fill the world with confusion. How should parents know how to behave themselves towards children, a husband, towards a wife of his bosom in such a case, if it were known, they were no more to counsel, exhort, admonish them, pray with or for them, than if they were devils. And if there were such a rule, how frequent misapplications would the fallible and distempered minds of men make of it, so that they should be apt to fancy themselves warranted to judge severely, or uncharitably, and, as the truth of the case perhaps is, unjustly concerning others, from which they are so hardly withheld when they have no such pretense to embolden them to it, but are so strictly forbidden it, and the judgment seat so fenced, as it is, by the most awful interdicts against their usurpation and encroachments. We are therefore to reverence the wisdom of the divine government that things of this nature are among the arcana of it, some of those secrets which belong not to us. He has revealed what was fit and necessary for us and our children, and envies to man no useful knowledge. But it may be said when the Apostle 1 John 5.16 directs to pray for a brother, whom we see sin in a sin that is not unto death, and adds, There is a sin unto death. I do not say he shall pray for it. Is it not implied that it may be known when one sins that sin unto death, not only to himself, but even to others too? I answer, it is implied there may be two probable appearances of it, and much ground to suspect and fear it concerning some, in some cases, as when any, against the highest evidence of the truth of the Christian religion, 
and that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah, the proper and most sufficiently credible testimony whereof, he had mentioned in the foregoing verses, under heads to which the whole evidence of the truth of Christianity may be fitly enough reduced, do, notwithstanding, from that malice which blinds their understanding, persist in infidelity or apostatize and relapse into it from a former profession, there is great cause of suspicion, lest such have sinned that sin unto death. Whereupon yet it is to be observed, he does not expressly forbid praying for the persons whose case we may doubt, only he does not enjoin it, as he does for others, but only says, I do not say ye shall pray for it, i.e., that in his present direction to pray for others he did not intend such, but another sort for whom they might pray remotely, from any such suspicion, namely that he meant now such praying as ought to be interchanged between Christian friends, that have reason in the main to be well persuaded concerning one another. In the meantime, intending no opposition to what is elsewhere enjoined, the praying for all men, 1 Timothy 2, one, without the personal exclusion of any, as also our Lord himself prayed indefinitely for his most malicious enemies, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do, though he had formerly said there was such a sin as should never be forgiven, whereof it is highly probable some of them were guilty, yet such he does not expressly accept, but his prayer being in the indefinite, not the universal form, it is to be supposed it must mean such as were within the compass and reach of prayer, and capable of benefit by it. Nor does the apostle here direct personally to exclude any, only that indefinitely, and in the general, such must be supposed not meant as had sinned the sin unto death, or must be conditionally excluded, if they had without determining who had or who had not. To which purpose it is very observable, that a more abstract form of expression is used in this latter clause of this verse. For whereas in the former positive part of the direction he enjoins praying for him, or them that had not sinned unto death, namely concerning whom there was no ground for any such imagination or suspicion that they had, in the negative part concerning such as might have sinned it, he does not say for him or them, but for it, i.e. concerning in reference to it, as if he had said the case in general only is to be expected, and a persons are to be distinguished, since every sin is someone's sin and the sin of some person or other, let God distinguish, but do not you. It is enough for you to accept the sin committed by whomsoever. And though the former part of the verse speaks of a particular person, if a man sees his brother sin, a sin that is not unto death, which is as determinate to a person as the sight of our own eye can be, it does not follow the latter part must suppose a like particular determination of any person's case, that he has sent it. I may have a great reason to be confident such and such have not, when I can only suspect that such a one has. And it is a thing much less unlikely to be certain to one's own self than another, for they have sinned unto death, are no doubt so blinded and stupefied by it, that they are not more apt or competent to observe themselves and consider their case than others may be. But though none ought to conclude that their day or season of grace is quite expired, yet they ought deeply to apprehend a danger lest it should expire, before their necessary work be done and their peace made. For though it can be of no use to them to know the former, and therefore they have no means appointed them by which to know it, it is of great use to apprehend the latter and they have sufficient ground for the apprehension, all the cautions and warnings in which the Holy Scripture abounds, of the kind with those already mentioned, have that manifest design. And nothing could be more important or opposite to this purpose than that solemn charge of the great apostle Philippians 2.12, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, consider together with the subjoined ground of it, for it is God that worketh in you to will and to do of his own good pleasure. How correspondent is the one with the other. Work, for he works. There were no working at all to any purpose, or with any hope if he did not work. And work with fear and trembling, for he works of his own good pleasure. It were the greatest folly imaginable to trifle with one that works at so perfect liberty, under no obligation, that may desist when he will, to impose upon so absolutely sovereign and arbitrary an agent that owes you nothing, and from whose former gracious operations not complied with, you can draw no argument 
to any following ones, that because he does, therefore he will. As there is no certain connection between present time and future, but all time is made up of undepending, not strictly coherent moments, so as no man can be sure, because one now exists, another shall, there is also no more certain connection between the arbitrary acts of a free agent within such time, so that I cannot be sure because he now darts in light upon me, is now convincing me, now awaken me, therefore he will do so again and again. Upon this ground, then, what exhortation could be more proper than this, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? What could be more awfully monitory in enforcing of it than that he works only of mere good will and pleasure? How should I tremble to think if I should be negligent or undutiful? He may give out the next moment and let the work fall and me perish. And there is more special cause for such an apprehension upon the concurrence of such things as these one. If the workings of God's Spirit upon the soul of a man have been more than ordinarily strong and urgent, and do now cease, if there have been more powerful convictions, deeper humiliations, more awakened fears, more formed purposes of a new life, more fervent desires that are now all vanished and fled, and the sinner is returned to his old, dead, and dull temper. Number two, if there be no disposition to reflect and consider the difference, no sense of his loss, but he apprehends such workings of spirit in him unnecessary troubles to him, and thinks it well he is delivered and eased of them. Number three, if in the time when he was under such workings of spirit, he had made known his case to his pastor or any godly friend, whose company he now shuns, is not willing to be put in mind or hear any more of such matters. Number four, if hereupon he has more indulged sensual inclination, taken more liberty, gone against the checks of his own conscience, broken former good resolutions, involved himself in the guilt of any grosser sins. Number five, if conscience so baffled be now silent, lets him alone, grows more sluggish and weaker, which it must, as his lust grows stronger. Number six, if the same lively, powerful ministry which before affected him much now moves him not. Number seven, if especially he has grown into a dislike of such preaching, if serious godliness and what tends to it are become distasteful to him, if discourses of God and Christ, of death and judgment, and of a holy life are reckoned superfluous and needless, or unsavory and disrelished, if he have learned to put disgraceful names upon things of this import, and the persons that most value them and live accordingly, if he has taken the seat of the scorner and makes it his business to deride what he once had a reverence for, or took some complacency in. Number eight. If upon all this God withdraws such a ministry, so that he is now warned, and admonished, exhorted, and striven with as formerly, no more, Oh, the fearful danger of that man's case! Has he no cause to fear lest the things of his peace should be forever hid from his eyes? Surely he has much cause of fear, but not of despair. Fear would in this case be his great duty, and might yet prove the means of saving him. Despair would be his very heinous and destroying sin, if yet he would be stirred up to consider his case, whence he has fallen, and whither he has fallen and set himself to serious seeking of God, cast down himself before him, abase himself, cry for mercy as for his life, there is yet hope in his case, God may make here an instance what he can obtain of himself to do for a perishing wretch. But for, if with any that have lived under the gospel their day is quite expired, and the things of their peace now forever hid from their eyes, that is, in itself a most deplorable case, and much lamented by our Lord Jesus himself, that the case is in itself most deplorable, who doesn't see it? A soul lost, a creature capable of God upon its way to him, near to the kingdom of God, shipwrecked in the port. O sinner, from how high a hope art thou fallen, and to what depths of misery and woe? A reading from the Redeemer's tears wept over lost sinners. John Howe